Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Zach, and here we talk about overlanding, gear builds, DIY, all sorts of stuff related to modifying your vehicle, getting out there, adventuring in the outdoors. Today we are going to be talking about something uh, slightly controversial, but not really, uh, more just a situation I've kind of run into and I have chosen to switch. So uh, as you all may know, uh, if you go on Facebook and you type in, what upper control arm should I use? Or if you go on a forum and say like, what upper control arm should I use? I feel like half the people out there will blindly comment SPC or uh, Icon, or I think even some people will say Dirt King. I don't feel like people know Dirt King as much, but uh, they just like throw out these things that everyone says. And it's like, I don't think they've actually done the research to know what options are out there. They just know what people talk about and some people have had good luck and who knows what their use case was. So it's hard to say whether that was even a good fit for them. One thing that I think is really tricky about searching for this sort of stuff on the web is everyone uses their vehicle differently. So there's so many qualifying questions that need to be asked the moment someone asks that question. You can't just answer that with like a good option for them. Like if somebody has not that much lift or more lift or they have a large tire or they have lots of offset or no offset, what is their lower control arms like? Are they gonna go to long travel eventually? So don't do this. Like there's ways to plan your build. There's ways to build your out your vehicle that's certain, you know, what's your maintenance schedule like? Is this a daily driver or not? How many miles are going on these? Do you plan on rebuilding them? Do you have a lot of miles on your vehicle right now? So you're gonna have to replace upper ball joints or bushings or things like this in the future. These are all reasons that you would choose one arm or another or make a purchase so that you're not spending extra money and you can actually plan out your build accordingly to save some money. So with all those things being said, I'm gonna kind of talk to you a little bit why I'm switching away from my SBC upper control arms to these Dobinson billet upper control arms. And this is no hard feelings to SBC. I was originally a little bit annoyed by my SPCs failing, uh, but honestly, I had heard all of a sudden from a couple other shops and a couple other people on Instagram that they had theirs fail as well. And uh, this seems to potentially be from something within the manufacturing process at SPC. And they actually replaced everything of mine, like almost no questions asked. They were super fast about it. So while it was frustrating that their product failed, uh, their customer service was great. So I, I really don't have anything bad to say about SPC, uh, but it is a little bit concerning to see these fail on sort of a manufacturer defect kind of side. My upper ball joint on the SPC control arm and my bushings in the ball joint, both were sort of out of the quality control spec at SPC. And so I'm just deciding to go in a different direction. But if I was like madly in love with this product or needed this adjustability, you know, it's something that I would consider. But I'll talk to you a little bit more about why I'm sort of switching at the end of the video. But first, let's jump into a little bit of an unboxing, understand a little bit more about what these upper control arms have to offer from Dobinson's. And let's jump into the install and talking about the product. So let's get into it. All right, hey everybody. So we're gonna kind of walk through these upper control arms a little bit here. Um, as you've kind of probably noticed by the title, I'm having issues with my SPC upper control arms. Uh, I don't know if that's because of running 35s or because their ball joints aren't as high quality. I don't know what it is, but my upper ball joints are basically completely failed. They are replaceable, so that's kind of handy if I wanted to keep running these, but I don't really know if the adjustability is that necessary, so uh, I'm gonna try out these upper control arms. They've got a lot to offer. These are awesome. They have adjustable camber. They have either two or three degrees of freedom, depending upon where you put these small included spacers. So if we just look in this bag that's included in the packaging, you get these two massive wrenches so you can tighten down these two nuts on each eye of the upper control arms, two arms, I guess I'll say. Um, inside this here though, we get two spacers and you decide on where to put these based on what kind of caster you want. So. If you want more positive caster, you're going to put the spacer in the rear to move the top of your spindle backward. And then if you want the other or the opposite, you'd put the spacer in the front. So we just are included these two spacers. And then we've got some miscellaneous hardware here as well. This hardware is included and used to pinch down on this spot right here. This is like a secondary locking mechanism on the length of these arms. And so I'm gonna kind of walk you through a little bit how to do this, but uh, the arms have what seems to be like way more camber adjustability than you would ever need. 
So there's a threaded portion on this actual eye of the control arm. Make sure that your rubber bushing portion is facing outward. Like I was saying, once you spin this out, there's this nut that you can move along here. Let me zoom in on the. There's this adjustable nut that you can move along here, but then there's also an additional sleeve that should adjust. So if we grab one of these wrenches, yeah, so lefty-loosey on that. It's a bit tight, but from what I can tell in the instructions, there's this whole sleeve and then there's the interior sleeve and then put the washer through here to lock it down. So you just have one of these screws and then this flange nut that doesn't have any teeth on it. I'm gonna show that. And you slide that through, you lock it down. So there's four of these bolts and nuts and then there's these two bolts which we'll just use to, to secure that ABS bracket that goes on every other upper control arm bracket. So I'm still trying to sort out exactly the sequence of how to lock this all down. I know that we need to have the rubber portions facing outward. Like I said as well, we'll put this bolt through and I don't believe it really matters on which way you orient this. I feel like these bolts could maybe use a little blue Loctite if you were worried about them coming loose. They also look to be stainless steel, but I'm not quite sure what material they are. These I'm really stoked for because the upper ball joints are not greasable and they are made in Japan. They're really high quality. They're basically OEM spec to the OEM upper control arms. The OEM upper control arms are non-serviceable as well. They don't need to be greased. So I'm really hoping that these are just kind of a set it and forget it option uh, because the bulk of the other Dobinson system is that way and it makes for just a little bit more peace of mind that I don't need to remember to grease all these zerks before I go on trips or I need to clean stuff and re-grease it and all that sort of stuff. So um, I think this is basically good to go. I was just gonna check this out up here. So these caps should pop out uh, pretty easily if I remember correctly. They're just held in with rubber. So let's just zoom out a little bit here. This cap is held in just, I believe, with kind of like a rubber seal on it. So before we put these on the vehicle, just pop this out. I just did it with a flathead screwdriver. We're gonna put some grease on this seal here. Just pop that back in. And then grab your caliper and set it to 39 uh, millimeters. And that's kind of the spacing that we want from the eye to the edge of this upper control arm. Uh, like billet portion. So if we zoom in here, what we'll do is we'll take our caliper and measure from the eye to that edge. So this needs to be adjusted a little bit more and then we should be good to go. Okay, so remember when you're setting these for their distances, you don't want them to bind because these need to be actually like perfectly parallel. So when that bolt goes through, it's not at a diagonal of some kind. So we want this to be a perfectly straight line. So in theory, the front plates of this arm are completely parallel with the inside shaft of these eyes. All right, so I'm just gonna go over quickly how to assemble all this and kind of dial it in. Because this camber adjustability is a little bit complicated for the average person, uh, they recommend you set it to 39 millimeters. So that's what I've done. I've set my caliper to 39 millimeters. You can use a little stick at the end between the teeth, however you want to do it. You do it from the eye to the edge of the billet portion. So you, you can test it multiple ways. This little stick here is a nice way to do it. Make sure this is 39 millimeters. I'll just show you guys. So stick it right here. Make sure it's 39 millimeters. All right, once you do that, the washer needs to be oriented just like this. You want the indented portion facing outward. So you want the portion that kind of, if you were to set it on there and it stands up a little bit, there's kind of a curve this way. You want that curve to face the rubber, just like so. So curved just like this. Face that there. Same with this curved portion facing the rubber. You want the rubber facing outward. When you tighten down these bolts, you wanna tighten this one all the way to the billet portion, 
and then you tighten this nut to that nut. So now you got these double nuts locked down. Last portion is going to be locking this bolt down on the back. This needs to be tight, but don't over tighten. And this gap definitely doesn't need to be closed. This is just a locking mechanism. They recommended to not put on Loctite, even though I thought maybe you could put some Loctite on this. It should be fine. So given all of those things, remember we need to grab our cap that we've popped out. I'm gonna grab our wheel bearing grease here. Any sort of grease should be fine. And we're just gonna put a little bit on this little bearing or this little seal here. So just kind of, I'm gonna just try and sort of push it in that little seal there like so. This grease is really soft, so it shouldn't be too hard. I ran out of my gloves, gloves I always talk about. So unfortunately this one today we're doing just with bare fingers here. Okay, you don't wanna to put too much on there. Get that all sorted and then push that down into that opening. Just like so, it's got a bit of a taper to it, but you can also tell where it needs to indent because there's a little cutout and there's a little cutout. You can see that there, there's a little, little teeny notch and then there's a little notch on there as well. So when you start twisting it around, that notch should find its home. So same thing for the other arm, grab a little bit of grease here. So I just, I try to kind of pack the grease around this seal here. Nothing overdone, but just so that that whole little rubber ring in there has grease kind of surrounding the whole thing. That's what I'm trying to do. We'll find that little notch again, and we'll press that into, kind of twist it, kind of if you saw that little pop right in, that should be good to go. All right. I'm going to wash my hands and we're gonna get out to the vehicle and we're gonna start installing these on the vehicle. All right, let's see how fast we can do this. What we're gonna do here is pull out this cotter pin and this castle nut here. Just like so. Nope. How about a 22? Yep. This right here is like a compression fitting or something like that. So this bolt is tapered, which means it kind of locks into that notch. I need this to hold tighter. That'll work for now. Okay. Alrighty, got one combo 19, the other combo 19 here. All right, so I got that arm out. Now I've got the washer member oriented curved away. Now I'm just running that bolt back through. I've just seen the bolt poke out on the back. So now I'm gonna put that spacer in there and then run it through the remainder portion of this arm. There. All right, got it through. Now we'll take the other one and the nut that I took off of my OEM bolt and put that on. There. Okay. So I think that's tight enough. I tried to not tighten them too much off vehicle because you need them to line up when you're pushing this bolt through but it's also very hard to tighten them on vehicle. I've kind of cut myself up here a little bit, so maybe just tighten them as best you can off vehicle.
whoops, I would say we want to tighten these for sure off with full load on. Let's do that for now. All right, so now that we've got that bolt through, got it all anchored down, should be good to go. The only thing left that we need to do is tighten down these little bolts on the inside of here. And I think they're, I think they're like a, they're, uh, they're probably a three ace. If they're not a three ace, they're metric. So pretty confident the head of this is a eight millimeter. And then the nut side is a 10 millimeter. Yep. Fortunately, wow. That is unlucky. Oh, here we go. There we go. All right, that's good enough. Said don't close the gap. It's unnecessary, so we won't close the gap. But that bolt is definitely pinching. There we go. Remember that bolt for the upper control arm, we're not gonna tighten until we get the vehicle weight on here. Well, made a mistake. That ABS line needs to go above the upper control arm. I didn't do that, so gotta take that off. Okay, so I've got the bolt through, got the two washers in, I've got the nut on the back here. You put it in with the nut on the bottom side so that if the nut ever comes off, the bolt with gravity holds it still in. This little bracket up here, you loosen up the little clamps for this line. Since I believe this bolt is stainless steel and since it's billet, I believe that means it's more likely to seize and corrode. I'm gonna put a little anti-seize on this bolt and it, well, that's where it's supposed to go. This little bracket, the hole is too small, so we're gonna drill that out. Stand by. <clears throat> gonna drill out this bracket because it's too small for this bolt. Let's try and do this. That is probably the least safe way to do that, so don't follow my example there. But, got it done. I'll do that a little bit earlier on for the other side. 12 mil. Just get it snug, that's really all you need. Grab our other 12 mil for the brake line on the spindle. Tighten that down. Push this through, take out our bungee, because it's definitely in the way now, and grab our new castle nut, reach in here, thread it on. Could put a dab of anti seize on there, probably tell you not to, but most people don't deal with the rust that I have to deal with, so that's what we're doing. Not too much, just a little bit. That cotter pin should help this from falling off if you're worried about the castle nut not holding as tight with anti C's. That is probably a 22 or a 21. I'm gonna guess 22. Nope. 21. Nope. 19, yep. Ooh. Dobinson, did you? I'd have enough space here to get in with the... Wow, sweet. Well, with the new castle nut, I don't need to use a boxed or a non-ratcheting combo to tighten this down.
All right, that should be pretty good right there. Eh, we'll leave that down for now so I can easily get in here and tighten that bolt. Otherwise, that should be everything. I left this a little bit loose so it can kind of slide in there. Pull this out and that's the install. Not too difficult if you've already done all your other suspension work. Let's go to the other side. So one of my biggest reasons for switching is I'm running 35 inch tires right now and I'm not gonna lie, they're heavy. They're not purposefully or really designed for the vehicle. I've had to do a lot to run them and alignments come and go. And I, I have a Firestone lifetime alignment. Thankfully the Firestone near me will do alignments fairly frequently, but I feel like they're really starting to recognize me and my forerunner sticks out like a sore thumb in the middle of Minnesota. Not a lot of people drive these overland style vehicles here. And so uh, I think that they know exactly who I am and they're getting tired of doing my alignment. So I maybe need to find a different Firestone. That's a different discussion. But what that all kind of also means is I would really prefer to not have to worry so much about which shop I'm taking the vehicle to. My SPCs were thankfully set by a Toyota dealership where they were comfortable with doing the SPC control arms. Uh, but I don't love the fact that so many shops refuse to work on SPCs. So that's one thing that kind of is annoying to me. And so you have to pay extra if you want to take it to an off-road shop and there's other jump, things to jump through. Also, the SPCs require a little bit of maintenance. You have to make sure you grease those upper ball joints. I feel like the grease comes out of them fairly easily. So it almost seems like you should grease them more often than even, uh, you know, every oil change, which I know what a lot of people do. And so for, kind of for some of these reasons, I know they're really adjustable, but I don't really think it's as big of a benefit as everyone raves about uh, because you have diminishing returns on running so much caster. Eventually there's kind of a pivot point and the more caster you start to do, the more all of a sudden in order to compensate for you know, toe and camber issues of all that caster, you're gonna start adjusting other things. And so you really can't like, run 10 degrees of caster and wow, you got your tire away from your firewall like five inches. Like it doesn't really work like that. And so uh, you kind of have diminishing returns with how much caster you can really do there. And I know that there's adjustability in camber as well on the SPCs, but I just don't know if I really need all that adjustability. And I really don't want to run that much caster because it definitely has performance uh, disadvantages, I guess I'll just say. So that's why I've been switching to these uh, upper control arms from Dobinson's. First of all, they're billet, so they're just extremely strong and they're lightweight. And uh, these have been designed really nicely to have like almost zero maintenance. So all I really have to do is set the camber correctly one time, bolt it down and we're good to go. And then I can leave the lower control arm to be adjustable by, you know, just your run of the mill mechanic doing alignments. And this makes it very simple and I don't need to find a special shop to do these sorts of things. And I just love the fact that I don't have to grease my upper ball joint. I can set it and forget it. And I don't have to worry so much because I use my rig as my daily. And so I'm putting a lot of miles on these things. And I just am trying to do things with the vehicle that are good performance. They're designed for more weight. They will operate well off-road and on-road. And also just minimize maintenance where I can because... Uh, if you start running down the rabbit hole of really high performance modifications, they all typically come with a lot of maintenance. And I'm trying to strike that balance between having a ton of maintenance and a good amount of performance and something that you can put a lot of miles on without, you know, really having to do tons of upkeep because upkeep is either really time intensive or you're going to have to spend a lot of money on someone else doing it, or maybe you're swapping products on and off often. And you know, for all those reasons, I just kind of want to minimize that. And I think that these Dobinson upper control arms are really high grade products and they seem to be very low maintenance. And there's this camber adjustability so that you can run you know, a more caster with that adjustable spacer. And then you can really maximize on the adjustment in your lower control arm because you have that camber adjustment still in your upper control arm. So. Yeah, those are kind of the things that I really like about these and why I'm running them over just a standard upper control arm because standard upper control arms will uh, kind of limit you because of that lack of camber adjustment and the fact that all of a sudden you may have more caster in your lower control arm, 
but it's gonna ruin your camber and so therefore you don't do it. So this is one benefit where I feel like Dobinson's has made this slightly adjustable, but not too adjustable. And I really like that balance. So thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all the support from you all. Hopefully you found this interesting and helpful and uh, might consider running these as well. I have them linked down below in the description. Uh, but with that being said, thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.